I would now like to welcome, this guy is a pretty big deal. He says he's not. For anyone that is new to the hoedown or farm sanctuary, Gene Bauer is the president and co-founder of Farm Sanctuary. He has been hailed as the, the conscience of the food movement by Time Magazine. For 25 years, he has traveled extensively campaigning to raise awareness about the abuse inflicted by industrialized factory farming and our cheap food system. Gene's latest book, Living the Farm Sanctuary Life, The Ultimate Guide to Eating Mindfully, Living Longer, and Feeling Better Every Day, delivers five tenets for maintaining and sharing a compassionate vegan life. His previous bestseller, Farm Sanctuary, Changing Hearts and Minds About Animals and Food, Touchstone, was published in March 2008. Ladies and gentlemen, with no further ado, I present to you Gene Bauer! Uh, well, well, thank you so much, Cameron. Thank you all for being here. What a great event, isn't it, to be among like-minded people? Promoting kindness and compassion and understanding. We need so much more of that in this world. And this is a place where it exists, it's palpable, and it can spread from here. So I would encourage you, again, to take a lot of pictures and share your experience here with everybody you know. Um, we are social animals. We rub off on those around us. Um, something that was said earlier was about how there's an, an emotional contagion. I think Lori Marino was talking about this scientifically between humans and other animals. And you know, I have been into these factory farms and when you walk into these places, you can kind of feel the stress and the violence that exists there. You can feel the fear that exists there. You walk into a, a, a gestation crate warehouse, for example, where you have pigs in these small two foot wide metal crates. You can hear them clanking against the bars the air is thick with the, the smell of feces. Um, the, the ammonia burns your eyes. Uh, the animals are stressed. People who work in these places are stressed. You can actually feel it. And when you go into a slaughterhouse, the same sort of feeling exists where it is just violence, it is just pain, it is disconnect. And I feel bad for the animals, I feel bad for the people who work in those places. And the good news is that we don't have to do that. We can live in a way that does not cause that kind of suffering. And it is a way that is not only good for animals, it is good for us, it is good for the earth. You know, living as a vegan, the way I like to de describe it, because so often, you know, when people hear you're a vegan, they wonder, well, what is that? You don't eat this, you don't eat that. And the term vegan, sometimes people feel, are you in or out of the vegan club, right? You know, so, so sometimes using the word vegan can be a little bit, you know, problematic from that standpoint. But I, I like to identify as a vegan. I do, I've been a vegan since 1985. You know, so, so yay vegans. But just recognize that when we label ourselves this way, it may feel like we're being exclusive. And this is a movement ultimately that is about inclusion. We include other animals in our sphere of compassion. We include other people. You know, again, for me, being vegan is an aspiration to live as kindly as possible. And that aspiration applies to other animals. It applies to other people. It applies to ourselves. Like Melanie Joy was talking about how important it is for us to take care of ourselves. Um, and so in this movement, we sort of live within an ethically impossible dilemma. You know, some of the speakers today were talking about, like Timothy was talking about the factory farming business and how they are actually now trying to frame these issues uh, of transparency and then create a narrative around it saying that eating and killing animals is okay, we should feel good about it. 
And this is very depressing, you know, and as, you know, Patrice came up and she talked about that and how, you know, ultimately oppression is oppression and it applies to various different subjects and it's imposed by those with power. And as human beings, we all kind of have, you know, uh, some power generally over other animals. And we grow up believing and being told that this is the way things are. This is the way things always have been. This is a natural way of being. And as Melanie Joy talks about in her books, it's a natural way of being. But it is an oppressive way, and it is based on discrimination and prejudice and disconnect from others. And so what we're really about, I think, is connecting with others, identifying systems and, and um, patterns of oppression, and then creating something different. So uh, Fair Oaks Farm in Indiana that Timothy was talking about is a place where this normalization of oppression is put on display. And it is a community shared experience that these animals are here for this purpose. And it's very depressing for us as vegans and animal people to hear about this active industry effort to normalize this exploitation and to then see how quickly people jump on and say, yes, that's okay. And they become okay with it. And when the little girl says, the pigs are suffering and speaks out against it, then the parents say, it's okay. It's the way things are. You know, so that is what our movement and many movements have always been about. Looking at things, seeing suffering, seeing oppression, seeing somebody hurting somebody else and saying, we want to help that individual who's being hurt. And, and that, I think, really speaks to the best of humanity. It speaks about empathy. And when we get involved in an oppressive industry, and you know, animal agriculture, of course, is a prime example of it, there is this tendency to start denigrating victims of abuse. And it happens in very subtle ways, sort of like what Patrice was talking about, how she had certain impressions of roosters, for example, or of other animals, and had, we all have impressions that are not necessarily very well considered. And, you know, we grow up and in this society, being called a pig is not a compliment, right? So this is a sort of subtle way that we denigrate victims of our abuse. Being called a turkey is not a compliment. Again, another subtle way that we denigrate victims of our abuse. And then we start coming up with stories to sort of lock in these abuses of others. And in the case of turkeys, you know, one of the things that I remember hearing when Farm Sanctuary started was that turkeys are so dumb that they'll go outside and drown in the rain. Now, we have taken care of turkeys for over 30 years now. They're free to come in the barn and go outside. We have never had one go out and drown in the rain. So we tell ourselves stories and narratives that bolster certain beliefs. And, and sometimes those beliefs are, are not, oh, not kind. And the good news, though, is that most people want to be kind. Most people don't want to cause unnecessary harm to others. And I think if we frame our movement in these terms, and ask if we can live well without causing unnecessary harm, why wouldn't we? It's very few people who would say, I want to cause unnecessary harm. There may be a few out there, but there aren't that many. So what happens is then people start coming up with narratives saying, we are doing this to help the animals. And um, you know, as part of this work over the years, my undergraduate is in degrees in sociology. I'm very interested in how society works in systems, social systems, belief systems, and things. Then I went to Cornell, and I got a master's degree in agricultural economics, because I wanted to understand the agribusiness mentality. And while I was there, I saw firsthand 
how people sort of lose their heart and lose their empathy and start doing what they think they're supposed to do. And that kind of is the crux of so much of this, where people lose their heart and empathy and do what they think they're supposed to do. So we were in this um, animal science class and the teacher was showing us routine procedures on baby piglets. And um, we went into the barn and there were two mother pigs each with about 10 babies, and they were in farrowing crates, so the mother had about two feet of space, and when she laid down, the piglets could nurse through the bars, and there was a little additional space on the side for the piglets, and that's how these mother pigs would live. Um, and so this teacher, you know, grabbed a pig out of the farrowing crate, held the pig up, took this tool, and cut off the pig's tail. The pig started screaming, was bleeding, was clearly in distress, all of the students in the class watched this and were upset by it, visibly upset by it. But this teacher you know, said that we do this for their own good because when we put them in, in, when we raise them and put them in these pens, they will bite each other's tails and that is an aberrant behavior that occurs because these animals are overcrowded. But it was framed as this is for their own good. And he talked about other things they do for their own good. The students still were not very happy with seeing these mutilations because in addition to cutting off the piglet's tails, they also notched their ears. They cut big chunks of skin out of the ears. And again, the baby piglets were, were screaming. This was done for identification purposes, we were told. Um, so eventually the teacher says, now who wants to try this? And everybody in the class looked down or stepped back. Nobody wanted to try it. But this is Cornell University. These are pre-vet students. Many of them wanted to do good. And eventually one of the students stepped forward and tried his hand at these mutilations. And then a second student stepped forward and did the same thing. Each time a student stepped forward and did this, you could see the initial resistance draining away and how this now is becoming normal. And then these students, as time would go, would then start defending this as, well, we do this for their own good. And this becomes the belief system. So they didn't listen to their empathy. They didn't act according to really their own humanity, but they did something they thought they were supposed to do. And when I went vegan back in 1985, you know, people think, oh, you're crazy, right? And many of you have probably had this experience going vegan, well, and, and What's cr interesting about it too is just how emotional it is, you know, and animal rights people and people who care about others and care about animals and are, are vegan are oftentimes criticized for being overly emotional. But I'll tell you, I have seen some factory farm people with their veins popping out, very emotional about what we stand for and what we're challenging. So all of us are emotional animals. You know, all of us are works in progress. And, you know, all of us also probably has some trauma that is invisible that we're not necessarily aware of. And we have triggers. Animal rights people and meat eaters, everybody. You know, we grow up with various stresses. And oftentimes this stuff is subconscious. And, you know, it all ultimately, I think, boils down to people wanting to belong and wanting to be loved, right? And wanting to be part of something and not separate from something. And food has often been how people gather together. The word comida, the Spanish word, you know, has the same root as the word community. We gather around food. So when a vegan says, I'm not going to eat animals at an event where everybody's eating animals, we are sort of voluntarily separating ourselves. And I think so many problems exist in this world because people are separated. And separated from each other and from animals and from the consequences of our behaviors on the earth. And then we just close our eyes and don't think about it because it's too painful to think about it, right? When the issue of factory farming comes up, people say, don't tell me, I don't wanna know. It's because it's too upsetting. The good news is we can make choices that we can feel good about. We don't need to turn away. We can actually act in a mindful way that is aligned with our empathy and our humanity 
and also aligned with our interests. And so that's really what this is all about. It's not about putting anybody down. And sometimes in our movement, uh, it is understandable why we can get very upset by the behavior of our species and the harm we cause on the planet. But getting too wrapped up in that is ultimately not very healthy, I don't think. So it's important for us to be aware of bad things, but then ultimately to not dwell in those bad things, but instead to dwell in the good things. And so that's really what this is about. It's identifying steps we can take and taking them, recognizing that we can't make everything perfect overnight and maybe never we never can. But taking small steps become very, becomes very empowering. So I'm just gonna go through a couple of uh, quick slides here that talk a little bit about the history of Farm Sanctuary and uh, have a few other comments. So, so anyway, that's our sanctuary now. It's a beautiful place. We're here. We're enjoying this together. Thank you all for being here, man. But it didn't used to be that way. It's not the greatest picture, but we started funding this organization by selling vegan hot dogs out of our Volkswagen van at Grateful Dead concerts. So that was back in like 87, probably. Um, and Needless to say, we've come a long way. But early on, we felt it was important to see firsthand what was happening at farms, stockyards, and slaughterhouses. So we started going in, and we would find living animals left for dead. And so Lancaster Stockyards, at the time, in the 80s, was the largest stockyard east of Chicago. We spent a lot of time here. I'm happy to say it is now gone, and we are still here. The first animal we rescued was Hilda. Some of you maybe have heard of Hilda. She's on the far right of this dead pile. We came up to this dead pile. It was, a hot, it was August 3rd, 1986, hot August day. The smell was horrible. There were dead sheep. There were dead cows. There are also dead pigs that are out of the frame of this picture. The maggots were so thick you could hear them buzzing. We took Hilda off the dead pile, took her to a, a veterinarian, thinking she would have to be euthanized. But as he started examining her, she stood up, and she ended up living with us for more than 10 years. And if you haven't visited yet, her grave is on the farm. So you should check it out if you haven't. But this is Hilda's ear tag. And she had a number at the stockyard in that industry. She was then given a name. She was no longer a commodity. She was our companion. She's no longer a food item, she was our friend. And that is really the core of what we're about. These animals are our friends, not our food. And, and that's Hilda, who after she recovered and she had lived a good long life. So this is a place of transformation where animals get to her, their lives are transformed, and ours are as well. And I'll tell one other animal story, and this is of Opie, who is a calf that I found at a stockyard in Bath, New York, not too far from here. This is in the early 90s. It was a freezing day, and he, he was a male who was born on a dairy farm. He was useless to the dairy farmer. So he was sent to the stockyard on the day he was born, still wet from afterbirth, afterbirth and he collapsed in an alleyway, and he was left there to die. When I came upon him, he was practically comatose. He couldn't lift his head. And I went up to the stockyard worker and said, what's going on with this calf? And he said, well, I got to bury him later today. Matter of fact, I said, well, what if I take him off your hands? He said, sure, go ahead. So I brought him here to Farm Sanctuary. He was on intravenous fluids. Uh, after a couple of hours, he started perking up and he was able to lift his head. The next day, he was able to stand on his own and nurse from a bottle. And then after a couple of days, he was walking and he was doing well physically, but he really wasn't thriving. And I wondered what it was that he needed. Then I brought him out to the cow barn to see his people, the other cows. And I put him in a pen. They all gathered around, started mooing to him. He started mooing back. He perked up and he started thriving from that point on. And he ended up living with us nearly 20 years, weighed close to 3,000 pounds at his peak. 
And here's a beautiful picture of me and Opie that Joe MacArthur uh, took. And uh, that's the kind of transformation that happens, right? And it's a beautiful thing. It makes us all feel good, right? To see this animal who had just been thrown away, discarded, to be cherished and loved. And when we love somebody else, that does as much for us as it does for them. I think that's a big part of our message. And you know, even science shows, and in my, in my book, Living the Farm Sanctuary Life, I talk about how science shows when we interact with other animals in a positive way, it actually improves our health and well-being. It lowers our blood pressure. It improves our lives. So this is such a beautiful message. Kindness to others is also good for us. You know, contrast going into a factory farm where animals are in misery, clanking against bars. Come to the sanctuary where they're able to run and play like Susie was showing in her pictures of these animals kicking up their legs. What a life. That does us, seeing that is actually good for us too. It's good for the animals, it's good for us. And, and imagine what it's like to work in a slaughterhouse. What that does to people. You know, I have seen the consequences of that and it's, and it's, it's traumatizing for everybody. Looking at those images is traumatizing but it becomes the norm. So this is, you know, one of the big challenges. How do we live in this world where we have this violence that's become such the norm? And when most people are participating in it without thinking, how do we deal with that? And I think the bottom line, we deal with it with kindness. And we model a different kind of behavior, and that's why you know, I encourage people to take pictures of themselves with some of the animals here and show that these animals are our friends, not our food. Because when people see that, monkey see monkey do, people see people do, they'll think, oh gosh, I didn't know pigs could be that way. I didn't know turkeys could be that way. Because we are modeling this new kind of relationship. We are social animals. We rub off on those around us. We do things we see other people do. I grew up eating meat because everybody around me was eating meat. The more vegans there are, the more vegans there will be, as long as we're nice, <laughs> you know, which is kind of important. I think also of Jackie Robinson, you know, the, the first African-American to play Major League Baseball, and how he was mistreated horribly, but despite it, he responded with grace. And that is, I think, a very good model for us to think about, is that um, we can't control others, we can only control ourselves. And we should realize other folks have emotions and even if we're not judging them, they may feel like we're judging them. You know, if we say we're a vegan or we don't eat animals, and they are eating animals, they sometimes feel guilty or they feel bad about it and they feel separated from us. And so then one of the approaches is to denigrate the victim or denigrate the minority point of view and say all oh, those vegans are crazy, for instance. That's one of the responses to that discomfort. But if we realize that and then can still be a positive example, and one of the best things we can do is bring great vegan food to work or to events and show people it's not that hard because if somebody eats a good vegan meal and they like it, a lot of the fear of change goes away. There's so many times when I've spoken to people and they say, you're vegan? Oh, I could never do that. Same people, after they have a great vegan meal, if it was like that, I could do that. So, you know, we have deep emotions, we have obstacles that exist, but sometimes just doing little things starts leading to big changes. And you know, there's the long-standing question of whether attitude, you know, changes behavior or behavior changes attitude. I think they both have an influence. And when somebody starts eating plants instead of animals for health reasons, um, they are, I think, much more open to the ethical and other issues because if somebody is eating animals and one of us comes by and says, eating animals is cruel, they might feel judged and criticized. But if the same person is not eating animals, even for health reasons, 
and we say eating animals is cruel, we have not, you know, they don't feel judged, and in fact, they might even feel validated. So often I have seen people who go plant-based for health reasons and then start opening up to many of these other ethical issues. And today, we have a convergence of areas. You know, there's more awareness about the cruelty because of the uh, internet and people sharing information. We have a lot more accessibility to great vegan recipes. You can Google vegan lasagna or whatever and find out all kinds of great opportunities there. Um, and climate change is really starting to be an area of concern. And of course, a huge contributor to climate change is animal agriculture. So when we talk about trying to live in a world that is compassionate, that we feel good about, and if we live in a world that is not being destroyed by our activities, and if we want to eat food that doesn't make us sick, because it's been estimated we could save 70% on healthcare costs by eating a whole foods plant-based diet. 70% in this country. That's an enormous amount. So if we encourage people to make choices that are aligned with our own values and our own interests, you know, that's that. It's, 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 and I think if we frame it that way, you know, we, and, and, and ultimately it is about trying to help others and trying to help others live well and, and to be healthy instead of eating food that gives you a heart attack. Um, but again, we have belief systems and um, socioeconomic machinery that kind of maintains the current status quo and all. You know, and by the way, there are doctors, including some who are here, who are, I think, playing a very big role in letting people know they can live well with plants and not animals. That's a huge part, I think, of why things are going in the right direction. You know, my father had a heart attack a few years ago, and when he was in the hospital, they were feeding him bacon and eggs. You know, I'm 55 now, and I hadn't been to a hospital in many years, so maybe about five or 10 years ago, I went to a hospital thinking, just should make sure everything's okay, and, so I start talking to this doctor, and he asked if there was any uh, heart disease in my family. And I told him, yes, that my grandfather died of a heart attack, that my father had a heart attack, and without taking any tests, he says, I might want to put you on heart medication. <laughs> and this is just kind of the normal routine. And these doctors oftentimes go on these continuing education, they go to conferences that are oftentimes sponsored by the pharmaceutical industry. So this becomes the norm and the belief system. And, and now, you know, my girlfriend and I go to the same doctor and he knows we're vegan and he's now moving in that direction. He's a pescatarian. So we can actually educate doctors if they're willing to listen. And some are more or less willing to listen. Just like some people are more or less willing to listen. So I think it's very important for all of us to remember that none of us has a crystal ball. None of us has all the answers. We are all just works in progress. And it's important to be humble. I, human hubris is one of our, I think, greatest uh, frailties. <laughs> it's a real problem. And, and just because somebody is doing something bad doesn't necessarily mean that they are a bad person or want to do something bad. So I think of that, you know, love the sinner, hate the sin. And try to find a way to help folks live in alignment with their own compassion, their own empathy, their own kindness, their own values, and their own interests. And each of us can play a very important role in our communities, um, where we work. And sometimes it's as simple as bringing a nice vegan muffin <laughs> or, or something like that. Little things like that make a big difference. And the other thing I just want to say is that you know, we like to talk about human beings being um, rational animals. I think it's a lot more accurate to say that we're rationalizing animals, and we tend to rationalize things if we don't feel very good about them. So over the course of our history, we've come up with a lot of really good reasons to do a lot of really bad things. And when it comes to eating animals, there's this belief that you need meat for strength, for protein, you know, which is completely a myth. Um, and you, know, you have folks like Cam Austin, who's an elite boxer, getting everything he needs on plants, for example, which is huge. And Cam Austin, by the way, has been such a great addition to this event. And then you also have this belief that you need to drink cow's milk to get calcium 
so you don't get osteoporosis, right? Many of us have heard this. It's a belief, but it's also a myth. In the US, we drink a lot of cow's milk and we get a lot of osteoporosis. So we need to look at empirical reality, then ultimately make thoughtful choices. And if we make choices aligned with our values and interests, we can see a huge change in this whole world. And instead of animals being killed, we'll see animals cuddled. And, and, it's, and it's, again, that is good for all of us. It is good for all of us. So I think that that is pretty much what I had to say. Oh, okay, one other thing. On, you know, when Timothy was talking about um, uh, Fair Oaks Farms in Indiana, this is part of this bigger thing of agrotourism. And while that particular operation is one that is very much geared towards enabling and continuing with this exploitive industry, there are other forms of ecotourism that are starting to pop. And there are, for example, developments now that are being designed around farms, like community-supported agriculture operations. Uh, in Philadelphia, there is, this is an agro-tourism exactly, or, or a new type of agriculture. Well, it is agriculture, but it's urban. There's old warehouses in downtown Philly, and one of them has been trans, trans, transformed into a veganic vertical farm. And the guy who's running this talks about creating green collar jobs in urban areas where there are not very many jobs. And then having healthy green food available right there. So these are the kinds of innovations that are starting to happen. And so I think we need to be aware of the bad things that are happening, you know, like uh, at Fair Oaks Farm and, and in other places. And, but we also need to be aware of the positive things that are happening. And I think dwell in those and give energy to those and support those and vote with our dollars and support vegan restaurants because there's more of them than there's ever been before and vegan businesses. And you even have big companies that are not necessarily our pals, you know, like Cargill, for example, that recently changed Cargill Meat Solutions Division to Cargill Protein Solutions because they're going to be including more plant-based proteins. And so you have things that are happening in different places. You have the industrial side and you also have the grassroots side. And I think it's all important. It all plays a role. Each person can choose what they feel comfortable about supporting. So somebody may not want to support a Cargill thing. That's totally cool. You know, but support the things you can support, engage in the activities you feel good about, and, and just remember that um, other people who are maybe behaving or doing things that are upsetting to us, it may be that they just don't even know about it. And uh, there's another story I want to tell about um, um, Andreas in New York City. There's a place there called, uh, and I told it earlier today too, but um, Beyond Sushi. It's vegan sushi place in New York City. And it's a great place. And the, the owners of it were not really that familiar with vegan stuff. And when they first started, they had like mayonnaise in one of their dips or something, although they advertised it as vegan. So, okay, that was a mistake, right? And so folks in our community were a little bit upset about things. They say they're vegan, but they got this. And Andrea said, has anybody spoken to them? And nobody had spoken to them. So Andreas went and spoke to them and they said, oh, sorry, we understand. And now they're very much on board with the vegan thing. So just because somebody's doing something that doesn't seem right to us, doesn't mean that it's necessarily being intended that way. And we can give somebody the benefit of the doubt and reach out and try to talk to them and say, hey, did you know this? Because oftentimes little things like that can result in uh, very positive developments. So um, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll just close here by thanking some of the folks who made this event possible. And, and by the way, all of you make this possible, make this move. So big thank you to everybody who is here.